So there was a man at the grocery store the other day, and he saw a woman who had a little girl in the grocery buggy sitting, you know how they sit in the back of the grocery buggy, and she, she was uh, strolling down the grocery aisle, she got near the cookies, and she, he heard from behind, he heard her say, Ellen, you, you, don't worry about the cookies, said, you don't need that right now, we're halfway through the store. She went on and got a little further, and he was still kind of dragging behind, got a couple aisles over, and uh, again, she said, Ellen, ignore the candy, pretty soon we're going to be at the cash restaurant, we're going to check out, and, and we'll go home, and goes on, gets to the last aisle, once again, Ellen, Ellen, no, you cannot have pretzels, you can't, no, just chill, we're almost at the cash register. She gets to the cash register. He happens to stroll in behind her. She's looking at all the candy. She's looking at the gum. She says, Ellen, you can't have any gum. Five seconds, we're out of here. And so she checks out. He said, ma'am, he said, can I, can I say something to you before you go? And she said, uh, yeah, sure, what is it? And he said, I, I just am really impressed with how well you disciplined Ellen and how she really responded to you. And she said, oh, Ellen's not my daughter. She said, I'm Ellen. <laughs> All, right. Okay. All right. On that note, how many of you love discipline? Say amen. amen. Discipline in ourselves is always fun. So last week we began talking about discipline, self-discipline, uh, the disciplines, if you will, Christian disciplines. If you were here last week, let me see your hand. I'm just wondering. If you weren't, let me see your hand. Everybody look around. See, this, this is the thing. If we could get all of us in here at the same time, uh, we would have to move to Joel Osteen's church. But anyway, so, it just, but it does help me to know how many of you were here so I kind of know where we're at. Last week, I, I began talking to you about the discipline, spiritual disciplines. Discipline is a word that none of us like to hear. Uh, it can, it can in, imply some really good things. It can imply some things that seem negative. A lot of times we think of, when we hear the word discipline, you may, you may revert back to your childhood. Think of being disciplined by the teacher, disciplined by your parents, disciplined by the, uh, the courts, whatever it might be. You might be doing community service. We have a young man who's doing community service. He's, he's in community service. He's been serving, helping us with the uh, re, rehab of the building over here. And uh, I call him community. If you were there yesterday, I kept calling him, I just call him community, you know, so he can identify that. But uh, discipline doesn't sound good. But discipline is the prere prerequisite, if you will, to it, most anything that is worthwhile in life. Uh, Reuben's over here shaking his head. Now, if you knew anything about Reuben, like I know about Reuben, Reuben, you, you see him up here playing the guitar. Listen, there is a discipline behind that. I, I learned to play guitar when I was in the 10th grade. I wanted to play. I took guitar at, uh, at uh, Donaldson High School, as a matter of fact. And my teacher had fingernails that were about an inch long. He was a classical guitarist. If you, those of you that know classical guitarists, you'll know they, they grow their fingernails out. It was kind of rather disgusting, but the guy could play, man. Classical gas, but he was tearing it up. That inspired me. I wanted to become like him, and I started playing guitar. So like you, Ruben, I practiced for eight to ten hours a day for probably a year and a half to two years. Pretty much seven days a week. I would come home from school at 2.30, I think is when I got out that time, and I would play until I went to bed around 10 or 11 o'clock. Uh, I did the same thing on the weekends, all day Saturday. Sunday after church, I'd go home and I'd play. And, and I didn't discipline myself to do that because I, I want to become a guitar player. No, I fell in love with music and guitar, and I wanted to be able to do that thing. Y'all follow what I'm saying, right? I wanted that skill. I, wanted, I, I loved the sense of being able to connect with others or other things in the world through music. And unless you're a musician, you may not fully understand that. But uh, whatever your skill, whatever your talent is, whatever your gift is, the thing that you want to grow in and to become better at, there's something inside of you, if you'll give this thought, uh, just a little bit of, a, a little thought for a moment, there's something inside of you that is wanting that to connect you with others in the world. 
It's something inside of you you're trying to let out. A poet writes a poem because he wants to express something that's deep in his heart, and he doesn't know how to get it out, but his gift allows him to release those thoughts in a way that they can be grasped by other people. And so poetry or songwriting or uh, authoring books and things of that nature, they grab the hearts of other people. I like to connect with, with, the, with uh, nature and with the animals. Lori laughs at me. I drive down the road. Anytime I see an animal on the side of the road, it could be a deer, it could be a cow, it could be a snake. It makes no difference. When I see it, I start laying on the horn because I like for that animal to look at me and I say, see there, I connected. And there's something inside of me that just loves to grab a hold of an animal's attention. And I know they don't know I'm there. They were mad at the horn or whatever. But anyway, there's something inside of you that wants to connect, that wants to <clears throat> come outside of yourself and be a part of a bigger picture. That's what community is. You want to be a part of something more than what you uh, are if you're by yourself or you're just inside yourself. I, you know, I paint a little bit. It's very abstract, which means I don't know how to paint. And you may be able to recognize what it is. And, and I, you know, I would say that's terrible. And you would say, well, it's abstract. You know, and so that's, that's the way painting is. But something inside of me that when I, when I, when I do art, whether it's playing a guitar, whether it's, whether it's painting, or, or I did this, I built, made this thing up here. It was to match a, a, pass, a card we passed out to an invite for Easter. When I do those kind of things, there's something inside of me that all of a sudden I go crazy. Uh, Gary Carbaugh. Gary, did you help me do this? Was Gary, Gary helps me with a lot of the arts things. We do sets, we build, and things like that. We work together on them. I think I did that in, what, an hour and a half, two hours? But that involves more than that. It's actually red wood that is light wood, and I painted the wood to look like old weathered wood and then put, did the painting on it. And the actual fading of the paint and all that was on purpose. It looks exactly like the handout. But all of a sudden, when I'm going to do something artistic, it's like this thing comes over me and I go crazy. When we did our Christmas set, I built 120, I say I, Gary, Pat Stevens, myself, there were some others. We built 120 foot of walls 10 by 12 feet high that came all the way around from that wall to that wall. It was awesome. And it was awesome. Thank you. It was awesome, wasn't it? We took two by fours and we built this huge wall and stretched it with canvas. And I painted the entire thing in less than a week with artwork. And it's like, it's just, when I think back, there's no way anybody could do that in a week. But I did. I did it with spray cans. I did it with rollers. I did it with all kinds of crazy stuff. But my point is this, there's something inside of each of us. I say this a lot. I'm trying to, this is what I really am trying to get across. Something inside of you that needs to express who you are and what God made you to be to the world around you. You were not created to be an island. You need to be a part of community. You, and that begins in your own personal family at home. It moves to the church. As families, we are community as a church. It should go outside the church to our community where we are a part of a bigger community, even though they're not all in the community of Christ. But we need to be connecting. We need to be expressing. We need to be doing. We need to be getting involved in government. You need to be involved in, in leadership in your business, in your, your uh, whatever occupation you have. You need to rise to the top because when you do that, not, not that everybody has to be in leadership. I'm not saying that. But when you do what you're designed to do and you do it the very best you can do it, you make God shine. You make God shine. You were created, and I was created to express the glory of God. Now watch this. In Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says that Jesus is the express image of the Father. He is the express image of the Father. He came to this earth in a human body to express what God looks like to the world. And he expressed that through kindness, through compassion, through love, through generosity, through teaching, through example of lifestyle, through holiness and purity, the Bible says that he was without sin. He came and in a human body as a man, he expressed the nature of God to the world. And Jesus is the, ex is the exact representation, another translation says. He is the exact representation of the Father. That's pretty huge. Yeah. This is a God you serve. He's not an if or a maybe God. He's a perfect God. He expressed himself perfectly so we could know that he is a perfect God through a perfect man. That's, that's pretty heavy, really. But here's the kicker to the thing. Now you and I, the Bible says, are the body of Christ in the earth today. 
We are the extension of God today expressing Him in the world. And if we can grasp this, the Christ in us, and I'm talking about Jesus in us, not some Christ nature like New Age talks about. Christ in you, the Bible says, is the hope of glory. So you know that's biblical when I say that. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The Christ in you is the hope of glory. It is the thing that drives you to want to reach that point that you become like Jesus. It's the hope of glory. It's the hope that you can be better. Listen, we live most every day of our life hoping to get better. Right? How many of you just, you've arrived and you're excellent and you're great and there's nothing more you can do, nothing more to learn, nothing more you can change or grow, or you just, you're just glad you're there, right? Okay, well, you're God, and we've got a seat for you up here on the platform, if that's you. But I don't think that's the case. And I think we live with a consciousness of, our, of, of being less than where God intended us to be. However, in Christ, we are, the Bible says, we are perfected in Christ, by Christ in us. And I want to get off into that whole teach, that whole idea, because I'm going somewhere totally different. I need to get back on track. But listen, Christ in you is the hope of glory. He is the expressed image of the Father. He now lives through us. Acts says, the book of Acts, uh, Paul said, that, uh, or Luke said, that, that uh, God sent the spirit of his dear son to live in us. So Jesus lives in us. When you tell your children, where's Jesus? He's in, in my heart. You ever feel a little weird saying that? Where's Jesus? In, he's in my heart. You know, we, have, we got a little grand, grand baby. We were telling her the other day, where's Jesus? He's in your heart. He's in your heart. And, uh, and we get a bigger picture, a different picture of that. But whenever you tell a child that, you think for a moment, okay, is there a little Jesus in there? You know? You know what? There is a little. They see a little Jesus in their heart. They really do. Y'all get that, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't even have the revelation, I think, that they have. That there is a Jesus in your heart. And he is the hope of glory. He is the expressed image of the Father. He desires to live through us in a way that our life expresses God to the world like he expressed God to the world. Now, that's the sermon in itself. I should quit on that and let's close in prayer. But I'm not going to. I'm going to move on. So, we're talking about the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines, things that, that uh, we have to bring ourselves under to be taught, to be trained, to learn, so that we can become greater and better than we are, so that God can be glorified more through our life. Okay, so I gave you the definition of discipline last week. I want to read it to you one more time real quick. Controlled behavior resulting from disciplinary training or self-control. And again, the fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit, the Bible says, is self-control. So I want to, I want to touch on that real quick. Watch this. The Bible says it's a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control is not something that you and I have a whole lot of. We've got some of it. God's given us the ability to control our lives, to do the things, to think, to process, to reason, and to act. But how many of you have ever lost control? So you don't have total control. If you look over in the book of James, where it talks about the tongue, it, it, we're told that the tongue is an unruly evil. Your tongue in your mouth and my tongue, the Bible said, is unruly and evil. That it will go places that you don't want anybody to know you went up here. The tongue can, man, I know. It was, there was one time in my life I said something I wished I wouldn't have said. No, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Y'all need to wake up. We all have the propensity to just, the tongue to get away and we can say things. And some people, some people's tongues are so sly, they say it in a way that they look, they look, like they're all good and it's okay. And yet at the same time, they're sticking a dagger in your back. It's just as evil. The tongue is an unruly evil. But, the, but James goes on to tell us, but guess what? The Holy Spirit can tame that tongue. 
So self-control is not entirely what me and you bring ourselves under and decide we're going to do it, we're going to change in our life, and I'm going to become better, and I'm going to quit this habit and that habit, and I'm going to learn this thing and that thing. However, there is an element of self-control that God has given us the responsibility to act in and to do things with our life. We initiate it, and the Holy Spirit steps up and empowers us to be able to do it. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says, uh, A man plans his ways. But the Lord ordains his steps. So we need to make plans to do good things, to do things right. We need to prepare and to plan for that in our life. And then the Holy Spirit will come and begin to lead us and to guide us as we do that. So controlled behavior resulting from disciplinary training is self-control and on human nature. Uh, but training, here's another one, expected to produce a specific character or a pattern of behavior in our life especially training that produces moral and mental improvement. So discipline works to enhance moral and mental improvement in our life. How many sports people do we have that played on a team when you were in school, high school football, college, or baseball, or whatever? You learn... Disciplines, military, we've got people who've been in the military here. Uh, different disciplines that you had to go through to become what the plan was that you should be when you walked out on the field to play the game. And I can remember in high school, I played football. I was a football star in my own mind. Uh, not by anybody else's mind. But, uh, you know, I remember how, how I was willing to put myself under some of the most grueling training because I wanted so much to be on, when I got on that field, to be the guy that everybody saw what I was doing. I wanted it so bad till I, uh, we, we were, uh, we were in uh, not spring training, the one they do in, uh, in August or whatever, just before, what do you call that, Scott? Camp. Coach Scott, camp, okay. We were in camp and uh, it was about 105, 108 degrees I lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and miserable, and guys were just dropping. They were passing out, and they kept pushing us. I mean, we were running, running. They would let you drop out and carry some water over there, and, oh, you're okay, kid, you're okay. And I remember I got to where, man, I was about to pass out. Listen, and there's, there's a place where we just don't, you can, you can push yourself to go far beyond what you think you can do. Do you know that? Every one of us in here do have a limit. But few of us get anywhere near our limit in the things that we really want to be great at. And yet we don't understand why we're not excelling in things. And so God has called us to be disciplined people, to harness our life, to pull things into order, and to give effort to what we do until we can control ourselves to go where we want to go and become what we want to become. Everybody said amen to that. All right. So... I want you to turn with me over to the book of Hebrews. I, I have, uh, I want to talk to you really about three particular areas of discipline. Last week we talked about the disciplines of prayer and uh, of giving, charitable giving, prayer and charitable giving. And I hope that inspired you to pray more often, to give more often, to study the word. Today I want to talk to you, and I'm only going to get as far as I'm going to get, because I've got a lot to say and a little time to get there, so I will, I'll get as far as I can. But I want to continue on the idea of uh, spiritual disciplines, but these three things. Activity, morality, and civility. Activity, morality, and civility. Disciplines that we need to harness in order that we train ourselves to become better people all with the understanding that we're asking Christ to empower us to do that. I want to clarify that and keep coming back to that. So, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 says this. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Did you get that? If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. How many of you like the concept, when you read the Bible, when you study the Bible, of God being your heavenly Father? 
Probably one of the most soothing, comforting thoughts there is, is that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who knew me before he formed me, who made me, created and designed me, has a plan for my life, but more than that, he's a father to me. That means I can go to him with my needs, I can go to him for direction, I can go to him with my fears and my anxieties. We just sang it as Dan led us. I am a child of God. I no longer have the fear that the world has. God being our Father is paramount. And the Bible expressly teaches that. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. When you pray, Jesus said, let us pray in this manner, Our Father which art in heaven. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say to his disciples, Guys, when you pray, pray in this manner, Our Judge who is coming to make sure we're in order. Hallowed be thy name. You know, that's how the Islamics pray, basically, in their conscience and their thinking. But no, we approach God as our Father. And so he says here, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. If you endure chastening, God will treat you like his son. Now, when I've heard this taught and when I've read this and studied this over the years, I've always applied the whole idea of God, while he's my father and he loves me, you know, he's got that leather belt that my daddy had. And because he loves me, he wears me out every once in a while. And so as I, when I looked up the definition of chastening here, let me read to you what I, what I, uh, what I got from the International Standard Encyclopedia. There are two words that are very closely related, and, and it'll, you'll see what I'm saying here. Chastening and chastisement. Y'all have heard the two different terms, right, in the Bible? Okay. Uh, these two words corresponding to Hebrew, to the Hebrew word makar, and Greek paideia, are distinguished in English use in that chastisement is applied to the infliction of pain, either as a punishment or for recalling to duty. In other words, uh, chastisement is to inflict pain to teach you to do the right thing. Okay? Might be a belt. Might be some other kind of punishment. Emotional, mental punishment. Prison, prison time. While chastening. Everybody say chastening. chastening. And this is the word that's used in Hebrews. While chastening is a wider term indicating the discipline or training to which one is subjected, without, as in the other term, chastisement, referring to the means of employed to this end. In other words, when, you, when it says uh, uh, chastening, it's not talking about a form of punishment. It's not implying that there's pain to be applied, and you're gonna, you're just, God's going to put you through this thing, and you're going to be so miserable, but all the way through it, you just know Jesus loves me, and he's whipping my rear end because he cares. That's not what that word means. What that word chastening means is it's training with discipline to bring about the end result that God wants in your life, that your heavenly Father knows is best for you. I don't know about you, but I I think I can look back and say, had I listened to my Father more, I would have had less trouble in my life when He was just trying to train me to be a disciplined person, to do things the right way. But we want to go do our own thing, our own way, figure it out for ourselves. Sometimes we don't want to be trained. And so if you, are you ready for this? Let God discipline you, chasten you. If you let God, everybody say let God. You know, we always talk about let God and let go, right? Well, maybe you need to think about letting God do this. If you let God train you, then he will in turn treat you like a child. His child, not like a child (laughs) in that sense. Are you with me? JT, are you with me? This church is feeling more and more Baptist by the day. Now, I grew up Southern Baptist. (laughs) I grew up Southern Baptist, and then we went Pentecostal, and I'm used to the hooping and hollering, and then we came back to the charismatic thing, so y'all just be what you got to be, but uh, Dwayne Sheriff always says this, if, if you don't give me some amens, I'm not moving on from this point, so, 
That one works a little better, okay? So get this. While chastening is a wider term indicating the discipline of training to which one is subjected without the means of the pain inflicted. God simply wants us to listen when He tells us what to do because when He tells us what to do, He's trying to train us to become disciplined people. Because if you can discipline your life, you can direct a lot of what happens in your life and not be the person who's just subject to happenstance and whatever happens, whatever is case, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. You know, we look at people who later in their life are well-established financially, and, and if you're a person who was not disciplined with finances, you can look at them and say, well, uh, you know, I don't know why they get to have all this stuff and be like this. And Well, guess what? They disciplined their life. They, they were frugal to get to that point. If we can learn discipline in every area of our life or whatever areas you're, 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 you're weak in, because we all have areas where we are in, then you can... Have some direction on where your life is going to go and how it's going to get there. We don't have to just wander through life and keep praying, you know, God fix this, God fix this. We were praying this morning over here in the office. I say that often, pray before we came out. We we're praying for the flood victims and for everything that's going on down there. And, and uh, I just prayed for, the, I prayed for those who are right now being, being uh, in the clash of the storm. And I, and I prayed and I prayed for those who were too foolish to leave that God would be merciful and help him anyway. How many of you know God's a good God? But how many of you know that's stupid? When your governor's been saying for three and four days, this is no joke, this is the worst hurricane that this nation has ever seen. We don't know what it's going to do, but you need to get out now. And then you say, no, I'm going to ride this out. That's just not very smart. Does that take a rocket scientist to figure it out? There are a lot of intelligent people down there right now thinking, what have I done? Literally, right at this moment. And some of them may die without the help of God. And we're like that. We all have things in our life that we know we should be doing better, but we're just not doing them. And our life could be so much better. So much better. Okay? So read on with me. Let's keep looking at what, this, what the writer here says, verse 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Now, I want you to get the reverse here. Not that God is saying, I don't want you because you're not disciplining yourself, but that you are not disciplining yourself. You're not moving yourself into the position of being his son to where he can then work in your life. You're not allowing him to father you, in other words. Furthermore, verse 9, we have laid human fa- we have had, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily in subjection to the Father of spirits be in subjection to Him and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but He for our profit, that we may be partakers of His holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And what does that mean? I can remember years ago studying this. And, man, I, I did a word study on righteousness, on, on peaceful fruit. I went all over that. Man, I studied it. I read commentaries. I tried to figure out what in the world is he talking about? What is this peaceful fruit of righteousness that he's talking about? And I, I just had this concept in my mind that it was, there was something that we're supposed to get. And, and then I came to realize it's just as simple. If you just do right, you're going to get the, pe- the fruit of peace. You're going to have peace in your life. It's that simple. If we just do the right thing. If you've ever sat in court waiting for the judge or the bailiff to call your name to be next. With the turmoil and the anxiety that's going through you at that moment. Had you just done the right thing, you would be at home peaceful. 
But we do things to put ourselves in positions where the anxiety is high, where trouble comes, where difficulty strikes us in our life. And it's often because we just did not do the right thing. We did not let God father us and discipline us so that we became people who could then control our actions and not act like the world acts and wind up in trouble like the world's in trouble. Pretty simple, right? Easy to do, right? So there was a man in a grocery store once. That's a bad joke. You didn't, you didn't laugh the first time, so. Okay. So go back to chapter, we're in chapter 12. Go back to verse 1 with me. Because we often talk about things and we miss the context. And I had never, not really tied this chapter verse 1 in context with this. And as I began to study it and look at it for this message, I began to realize that this whole chapter is context. It seems to break context, but it, I don't believe it does. I believe it's all context. And, and so I want you to follow this with me. Look what he says first. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Now, you need to know this. He just came out of chapter 11. Chapter 11 is a chapter of faith, the faith chapter, all the great men of faith and what they did and how they lived for Jesus and how they died and didn't get to see the promise, but they lived by faith their whole life. They were very disciplined in the things of God, and they overcame, but they died, and they'll get to see their reward when they got to heaven, right? He says, therefore, since we have this cloud of witnesses. Now he's talking about people, those people, as well as every other saint who lived a godly life disciplined life and because of their discipline and their life they went ahead of us into heaven and they're with God now and he said so we've got this cloud of witnesses that guess what lived it right did it right and made it to the finish line and they're they're this cloud up there and they're counting on you and I to do it right because they've passed a baton down to you and me, and we're carrying it, and the race is not over until Jesus comes back and calls the church out of the earth. What they're saying, what he's saying is, look, there's a great cloud of witnesses. These guys gave their lives for me. Some of them were sewed up in sheepskin in, in the Roman days and put out in the Colosseums and, 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 and sent out for wild animals to attack them, thinking they were animals and to kill them. Others were boiled in oil. Some had their heads cut off. Some were hung up down upside down on crosses they were killed by gladiators every kind of torment every kind of torture you can think of he said these people have gone before us they did it they finished the and they're counting on you and i to continue this thing and not drop the ball we need to get this picture they were they were disciplined to the point of death and then he goes on and watch what he says next. And if you can hold this same context in your, in your mind there. Looking unto Jesus. Well, 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 back up, back up, back up. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How many of you know you had to be disciplined to run a race? You're, you train, you go through training, you become... You become disciplined to run that race. <clears throat> but he says, the first, first thing that he's talking to here, talking about are the men who finished the race. Secondly, he's going to, he says, that therefore we need to do what they did, and we need to lay aside the sins in our life that are weighing us down so that we're not competing in a way that we can win. But we're struggling, we're, we're battling. Okay? And next he's going to talk about Another man who was disciplined. Look at the next verse. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus also finished the race. And he tells us how he did it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of God on the throne. Now watch this. Jesus went through the scourging on his back carrying the cross up the hill as far as he could, all the way up to, to, to Calvary and Golgotha, where he was disciplined enough, the Bible says he stretched out his own hands. And they nailed him to a tree. He was, dis, he was uh, disciplined enough and in control of his own life enough to, out of his great love for us, 
for the joy set before him on the other side of the cross. He knew what the other side of the cross, the peaceful fruit of righteousness it was going to bring if he got to the other side. If he endured this thing, he stretched out his own hands. So we've got the men who went before us who were disciplined and finished the race. We've got Jesus who was disciplined all the way to the cross and finished the race. And we're told to lay aside the sin and the weights and the things that are stopping us from running like we should be running. Next, watch this, next thing. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now watch this, here's the great part. Everybody say, here's the great part. I want to make sure you get this. Here's the great part. Jesus is the finisher of our faith. See, you, you don't have to be strong enough to do this. And when I'm talking about discipline, and, and the Bible's talking about discipline, we get this, 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 this looming cloud over us that, God knows I've tried a million times, I can't do this. No, Jesus is the finisher of your faith. He is able to complete that which we have committed to Him until that day, the Bible says. Christ in us is the hope of glory. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond all that you can ever think or ask according to the power that works in us, which is faith in Him. Come on. Are you getting this? I can do all things through Christ who... It's not me. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory that will carry me through. But I have to be willing to step up and say, Coach, I want to play ball. I had friends that wanted to play football. They told me later on during the season, I wish I would have played. Guess what? You know why I didn't play? Because they didn't do like I did and go to the coach and say, Coach, I want to play. And he looked at me and started laughing. True story. He laughed. 11th grade, I weighed about 90 pounds. I'm not kidding you. And I was this tall. Daniel Johnston looks like a giant compared to me. I was this big. And he literally laughed. He said, well, he said, all right. If you want to play, come on out. And yes, they beat the snot out of me. <laughs> I've got neck issues today from that, literally. But you know what? I wanted it. I wanted it. And when it was game night, though I set the bench most of the time, I had the uniform on. I mean, that's just it, you know. If, they, if they'd let us play like we played in the front yard, I guarantee you I'd have been making touchdowns. But they wouldn't let you do that. They wanted to make you do it their way. You know? Son, what are you doing? That's not the play. You know how many times I heard that stuff? Y'all can't imagine me being that way, right? I played saxophone in junior high school, all right? So I started out with a, it's not an alto. What is it, the main sax? Tenor? Tenor? One of them, anyway, this one. You know, well, I, I wasn't about to learn the notes. Who had time for that? I mean, there's beautiful music everywhere. I wanted to be a part of it. So teacher said, look, you know, we're going to move you to the bass saxophone. And y'all don't even know what that is. But when they brought it in the room and gave it to me, I sat in the chair to play it, because that's what you had to do. And, and it sat on the ground and came up like this. And I'm, doom, 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 doom. I mean, I thought I was in heaven then, because, doom, 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 anybody can do that, you know. I wasn't a guy that wanted to play by rules. Y'all follow what I'm saying? So I didn't get to play in the marching band, because I never learned to play. When it came to football, I was going to play. And let me just say this to you. You can want to play this thing called faith, or you can wall around and play around with it. You're only going to be as effective as a believer. You're only going to see as much of the power, the manifest, manifest spirit of God in your life as you are willing to play. Yeah. 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 Nobody can step up to the plate but you when it comes to this matter. Yeah. I, as a pastor, I... Sometimes have gotten frustrated at people saying, idolizing all these great men. I've had people tell me, just tell you. They'll tell me that they're readers and they read about all the great men of faith. And they come up and they talk to me like, like nobody in our church is like these people were. You know what I'm saying? Y'all get what I'm saying? I'm like, just go home, play with yourself, just leave us alone, you know? Really, what I always think, and this is the truth, I'm just thinking out loud, probably not a wise thing to do. What I'm thinking is, 
why are you telling me that? You're worse than I am. That's what I'm thinking, right? <laughs> y'all, y'all know what I'm saying. But they're coming up there. They're wanting us to be Dwight Moody's and, and uh, Edward, you know, all these people. And I'm like, dude, you go home and get your life right, and then you come back. It boils down to this. Why don't you go home and play the game like you won't tell me to play it? You know? So, so let me just hit you right between the eyes. You are as deserving. This is nothing. Here, oh, there it goes again. Wow. They will, they will preface all this about, you know, Pastor, I have a real discerning spirit. I get so sick of hearing that. I have a real discerning spirit, and God's showing me that we're just not where we should be as a church. And, and, uh, and, and, and they'll go into this whole thing, and it's like, you know, I don't even know where I'm going with that. I just got sidetracked and started thinking. <laughs> it's not good. Get me back on track, Ana. Get me back on track. And so, oh, let it marinate. <laughs> Listen, the bottom line is this. We all are where we are because of what we're willing to do. It's just that simple. We are where we are for what we're going to do. And what I was going to say is, when it comes to fasting, how much are we fasting? How often do you fast? I'm speaking to myself. How much time do we really put in consistent, consistently put into the disciplines of prayer, fasting? You know, last week I started out by reading Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus gave some disciplines. And, and we talked about prayer and charitable giving. He said when you, when you go to pray, do it in a quiet place. When you give, don't do it in front of people. But what I didn't do is go on and read the rest of that chapter where he also said, and when you fast, anoint your head. It's a spiritual discipline. How much are we fasting? How much are we praying? How much are we even caring? We need to let the Holy Spirit challenge us on where we are and not look at other people and try to compare ourselves. I'll never be a Dwight L. Moody. I'm not Dwight. I wasn't intended to be Dwight, and neither, neither were you. You're intended to be you, but you're intended to be the best you you can be. And, when, and I was going to, and I'm out of time, but I was going to Actually, today I was, we're going to talk about act, activity, uh, morality, and civility, and those three. And so I'll just hit them real quick. But so this right, right, right here, number one, activity is what are you doing with your body? What are you doing with your soul? If you're not working it and using it for a purpose, it will fall apart. So in doing this real estate stuff, we go around, we see a lot of houses. Some of them, it's repulsive to go in and see how some people live. You're like, are you kidding me? You live like this? And the houses are falling apart. And you know what? The house may be the same age as the one we came out of down the street that looked like a brand new house because somebody cared and took care of it. And if you don't care for it and you don't take care of it, it'll begin to fall apart. It'll crack. The sheetrock will crack. The doors will stick. The windows will stick. uh, It'll grow mold. All kinds of things will happen if you don't just work it and take care of it. How much more your physical body? If you don't care for your physical body and you don't try to take care of it and you don't eat right and you don't exercise and you don't, uh, you don't move around and do something worthwhile with your time. You vegetate on the couch and watch TV eight hours a day and then you get intestinal cancer and ask God why. I'll tell you why. Because people that sit down and don't move get intestinal cancer. It's a byproduct of that. My grandmother died from that. But she had rheumatoid arthritis and could not move around. But that was the kicker for her getting that cancer. Move your body. Dance. Do something. Exercise. Do something. You know? Activity. Morality. Obviously, I'm just breezing over these. But morality. We have a responsibility to live moral, morally disciplined lives before God. Man, when you look at the scripture, you know, the culture we live in today, it's like, oh, you can just live with whoever you want, sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want, and God's understanding because he knows you just have a broken heart. You had such a hard time growing up, and your parents were divorced, and, and, you, and you just don't understand marriage and all this. And, and so, you know, but you love this person so much that you wouldn't want to hurt his feelings when he says, if you love me, you'd sleep with me because that's the way you express love today. And Everybody knows it's okay, and God will be all right with you. No, he won't. He hasn't changed on these things. There's a moral standard in the scripture. 
And yes, you have to discipline your life to meet that standard. You've got to rise up and say, I'm going to do what God said. If you don't, you're going to face the consequences of that life. And let me just breeze over that real quick. Number one is there are 43 now venereal diseases that you only get from fornication and homosexuality and, and immorality and adultery. That's the only place you get them from. And then you want to turn around and say, God, why did I get this disease? Because you went to where it was. It's not that hard to figure out. You jumped in that cesspool and you got it all over you. Immorality. That's the least of the problems with immorality. The greatest is what you're doing to your soul. You are destroying your soul when you sleep with someone that you're not married to. I'm just telling you straight up, this is what the scripture teaches. You will, become, you will become bonded to that person in a way that is unnatural and ungodly. The Bible says, For this call shall a man leave his mother and father, cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall become one flesh. When you sleep with somebody, you become one flesh with them. You go over into 1 Corinthians where he talks about it, and he says that come out from among them, or come out and don't be, don't, don't, uh, Join yourself with a harlot. It says, for he who joins himself with a harlot is one with her. But he who joins himself with the Lord is one with him. So however many people you've slept with in your life outside of marriage or slept with, period, you, there's some bonding that took place there. There's some soul ties that took place there. There's some things that are lingering in your soul that are weights that are hindering you from running this race the way God intended you to run it. They're pulling you down. They're hurting you. You don't know it. You may not know it. You may know it. And then there's the emotional duress that happens when that relationship parts. And I know people, they suffer divorce. And I understand that happens. And I'm not touching on that at all. But I'm saying, when you just live with somebody, which our culture finds just okay now, when you live with somebody, there's something going on inside of your soul that is, that is just... It's, it's tormenting, and you may not even recognize what it is, but you're lacking the peace of God because God is displeased with that. And when I grew up, there's one thing I knew, and that is when my daddy was mad at me. I knew when I was out of good graces with my parents. And man, I couldn't live with that. I hated that. And that's the way we are when we're not living up to God's standards. There's something inside of us that's just, man, this is just not good. It's not right. It, it, it weighs on you, and it hurts you. And it isolates you. And the Bible says, God said, is my hand too short that I can, I'm quoting scripture, my hand so short that I can't reach down here to help you? He says, is my ear so deaf that I can't hear your cries? He said, no, but your sin has separated you from me. And so immoral, immorality separates us from God. And so we can cry out to God in a time of need and God can say, you know, you've been living this life and and, and God doesn't jump back and say, whoa, I'm not listening to you. No, it's that you and your heart are like, God, I can't get to you because I know what I've been doing. Now, the good thing about God is he's merciful, he's gracious, he's forgiving. If we will truly repent and turn to him, the Bible says we have, we have, a, 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 we have a, a, a great, eh, the word's slipping me, advocate with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father. He's got to write these things to you that you might not sin. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, who became the propitiation for your sin. That means that He stepped in my place and He died for my sin and He died for your sin. And so He wants to do that. And He will deliver us, He'll forgive us, He'll set us free. But you've got to make the changes in your life. You can discipline every area of your life and not discipline your morality and go to hell. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says all fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's scripture. If I didn't love you as your pastor, I wouldn't tell you that. But if I never tell you these things, I'm not much of a man. If your father loves you, he disciplines you. If God cares about you, he's telling you these things up front so you can get your life in order, so you can be blessed today, so you can live in the blessings, and so you can have eternal life. But we don't make the rules. And they don't change because culture changed. Come on now. It's just, it's just how it is. And so if you're living together out of wedlock, you need to get married, you need to do it quick. You say, well, who are you to tell me that? I'm nobody to tell you that. I'm just telling you, if you want God's blessing, you need to do it and you need to do it quick. Yeah, but you don't understand our relationship. No, I don't. I sure don't. 
Because when I fell in love with her, I wanted whatever it took to lay claim on her. <laughs> Did anybody hear what I just said? I wanted everybody. So I remember sitting in Pizza Inn. We we're, were in college. And I'm sitting down at this table, you know, this booth, and there's four or five guys, and I'm sitting there. And one of them says, somebody said you went out with Lori Payne. And I said, that's right. <laughs> and they all started laughing. They said, there ain't no way she'd go out with you. <laughs> that's true. They didn't know that I already had asked her to marry me, and she already had said she would. And I wanted so bad. But we had agreed we weren't going to tell anybody for a couple months. I'm like, mm-hmm. She, Lori Payne ain't going out with you. What are you talking about? And I'm like, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> but I wanted to lay claim on her. <clears throat> but because of culture, the culture that we live in, because of so much of emotional damage that so many of us have been through, and because of the poor examples of marriage that we've grown up with, we have a really hard time believing in marriage anymore. And what we've got to believe in is not our ability to stay married or our ability to, to form and, de- and develop a good marriage. What we've got to believe in is that God will step in if we'll let Him. And God will help us. And God will give us a good marriage. And we're going to hurt in the process. And we're going to get pushed down and disappointed and feel rejected. And, 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 and we're going to sometimes almost regret what we've done. But if we just stick in there and let God do it, if we discipline ourselves and we say, I'm in this for the long haul, God God will rise to the occasion to make sure that your marriage becomes a great one. You just got to hang in there, and both parties have got to do their part. And any one of you can bail, jump ship, and blow the whole thing, or you can say, God, I'm in this for the long haul, and let him do it. And then civility is the last one, and it's 12.01, so I get 30 seconds. It just means to be civil, to treat people well. To be kind and compassionate. To talk nicely to people. To be civil in how we live. We, we live in a culture, where, again, where things are so cut and dry and black and white. And, uh, you know, boom, boom, boom. Huh? Yeah, I like texting. That's a great one. Somebody's talking. To, I'm doing this, but I don't do that. I, I'm too old. I do this. I watch these young guys, you young people, I watch y'all. You know, I'll shoot, I'll shoot one of my kids a text that took me 15 minutes to write. Ding, ding! What the heck? How'd they do that? Anyway. But you can be so rude and so inconsiderate of other people if we're not careful. And we need to learn to be civil, and it's a discipline. You say, well, that's just not who I am, I'm Irish. Well, I'm Irish. I know, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> And you're that guy. Okay, so there's no, there's no excuse for treating people less than respectful. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? You just need to learn to be civil. I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop there. There's a verse I didn't get to, and since I just quit, that, uh, you know, it talks about bodily exercise, and it says bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness, exercise unto godliness, profits much. In a, we take those, that comparison and we say, well, bodily exercise is not all that important. It's very, very important. Uh, I want to encourage you. I'm 56 years old. If, if you're younger than I am, and most of you are, get yourselves in shape now. I started exercising when we moved here. We started going to the YMCA down there. The church uh, had several people there, so Lori and I went ahead and connected down there. And we've done that for on and off, not been the greatest in the world. I've not been trying to be a bodybuilder, as you can tell. But I've tried to keep myself in good shape. I was talking to the guy at Harvey's. We've now moved over to Harvey's where you guys are. I was talking to them the other day, and he said, so what is your plan? What is your goal at Harvey's? What do you want to accomplish? I said, I just want to stay alive. (laughs) That's it. I just want to stay alive. (laughs) He started laughing. He said, I get that. Listen, when you're 57, you just want to stay alive. But listen, I am, I'm really glad that for the last 15 years of my life, I've, I've walked four miles or three miles fast. I've exercised. I've done what I've done because 
I don't feel like a 56-year-old. I'm 56. I'm not 57. Dang, I'm even younger than I thought I was. I'm 56. I, you know, I'm glad that I did that. I wish I would have done more. I, there are other areas of my life, like in my eating habits, that I wish I would have eaten better. And so Lori and I are rising to the occasion, and we're trying to change those things. We're getting some direction from some pros at it. And uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to bring these things up. Well, listen, you know, they say about your health that what you eat today does not affect your health today. Well, I mean, you know, how you feel and stuff. But your, your body's resistance and its, and its disease propensity is based on what you ate 10 years ago. Y'all aware of that? It's what you used to do that laid a foundation. And so it is that way with all disciplines. What we do today, we will be glad we did tomorrow. And if you want to be so close to God that, man, you're walking in the power, you're walking in the authority, your head's above the clouds, you're not depressed all the time, you're not, your relationships are not constantly struggling, you're not battling relationally with people and you can't get along with anybody in the world and you want to isolate yourself. If you want to get past all that stuff, you start living for Jesus today. You start disciplining yourself to read the Bible, to pray, to spend time with God fast as He leads you. Attend church like you are. Man, you grow here. God's good, good to us here. We grow, we help each other and do these things. Stand to stand your feet with me so I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. If there's an area in your life that you need to harness and pull in and begin to discipline, to bring under the discipline of God, <clears throat> to let Him train you in so that you can become more of what He desires and you can glorify God more. If there's an area in your life, raise, raise your hand and just acknowledge that. Because there's something about us just saying, hey, that's me, Lord. All right. So my other hand went up. My leg's up. <laughs> right? So I want to ask you, I want to challenge you to do this today. I, I don't want you to look at five things and say, I'm going to fix five things. It's overwhelming. I want, you to, I want you to focus on one thing this morning. And we're going to pray in a moment. And I want to pray that God speak to us. And that God speak to us about one thing. And that one thing, let's make a commitment to the Lord that I'm going to work on this one. And when I begin to bring it into order, then I'll say, Lord, let's add another. Let's get another thing in order. And let's work. Will you do that with me? Will you do that? So let's just pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, right now, uh, we, we do, we know that we need you. We know that. There are things that we would have changed a thousand times if we thought we could change them. And we just don't think we can, so we push it out of our mind. And, and we just say, that's just, I can't do that. I, won't, I can't face that. And so I pray, Lord, that this morning that you will awaken us to righteousness, to the need to do better, to the need to let God dwell in us and correct things in, as our trainer, our disciplinary, our father. God, we just want to become more like you. And that means change in our life. So Father, I pray that you would speak to each one who's willing this morning, and, and I'm first, about one thing at least in particular that we can go from here today and set a goal and say, I'm going to give this area of my life back to God. I'm going to let God take charge again. I'm going to let him speak, let him train, let him discipline. When he says turn right, I'm going to turn right. And when he says turn left, I'm going to turn left. When he says go long for a pass, I'm going long for a pass. And what you say is what I'm going to do because you're Lord of my life. And I, I, I really, Lord, we're just frankly tired of having to live with dissatisfaction because we've not done what you've been nudging us along to do. So God, this morning... We give ourselves to you. And so you just pray that and you tell the Lord what that one thing is. If, it, if he's already brought it to your attention, then tell him right now what that is and make a personal commitment to him to do that thing. And I'm going to do the same. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. God is good, isn't he? Aren't you glad he gives us about a billion chances? He's good. 
Amen. Well, God bless you all. We love you. And uh, pray you have a great week.